We live in a time where masculinity is shamed and men don't know what it means to be a man. As a pastor and counselor, I've spent the better part of my life equipping and training others. My goal with this show is to translate my hard-earned experience into tools and tactics to help you become stronger as a man. This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bellows. Brave Co. Men, welcome back. This week, I have a really cool guy that I think you guys are all going to love. His name's Dr. John Deloney. Um, John is the best is a best selling author, mental health expert, and the host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. Uh, he's got two PhDs, which is two more than what I have, and uh, has some um, best selling books: uh, "Own Your Past, Change Your Future," and "Redefining Anxiety." And I'm most excited about his new book coming out that we're going to talk a ton about. Uh, it's building a non anxious life. And John, I got to tell you. Um, uh, probably like you, I get a lot of books sent to me and don't read most of them. And um, in preparation for this conversation, I opened up, you know, the book and and started to go through it. And I, I actually finished it in a day. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And so it's all earmarked and highlighted and tore up. And uh, I had to, I went over to some friend's house last night with my kids and I was just, I was just taking them through some of the stuff in the book that I really liked, you know, the world that we live in today is, is a crazy world and you've done such a good job, probably in one book, probably the best job that I've seen so far of helping people really narrow down what's most important and how to get there and building a non-anxious life. I don't know that there's uh, besides following God, you know, besides taking care of your family or whatever, building a non-anxious life is all a part of that. It's how do we do that? How do we get to a place where our lives are full of peace, are full of hope, and and we can we can live on um, a life that really matters? And you've done that in this book, and so I am actually really excited to dive into some of this and to help the men that follow Braveco. Uh, give them another tool in the toolbox that really outlines it. So well done, man. Good job on this book. Dude, I'm I'm going to clip that intro and send it to my seven-year-old daughter and say, see, <laughs> see, your dad's not an idiot. No, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, that's uh, I'm glad that uh, the book hit home, man. Um, like writing a book and putting it out there before the release date when people are slowly starting to get copies. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, there's naked pictures of you out there and you're just nervous. Like, do I look good? Do I look good? And so, no, thank you. I'm really grateful for that. And, and like, uh, I, w- I would be honored, man. And you may have already done this instead of just following like a normal, like just regular old media questions. If you've got things that you highlighted in that book, I'd love to hear what hit yeah. well, what, what questions you had, what didn't hit well. That'd be awesome, man. Yeah, no, we're going to go through, we're going to go through some of that. Um, that's great. Dude. And I, yeah, I want to actually read a little bit from the book um, through some places because, um, I have, I have spent a large part of my life dealing with anxiety. And before I was ever even conscious that I was struggling with anxiety, um, I was, I was deeply, deeply gripped with anxiety. And as far back as I can remember, actually, um, I found, I found masturbation when I was 10 years old. I was completely addicted from 10 to 16 years old uh, in masturbation and, and actually didn't really know why for a very, very long time and didn't realize that I was using masturbation to cope with my fear. Uh, I have, um, uh, I struggled with OCD for a really long time and didn't know it. And so the fear of death, the fear of something being wrong with me, um, all the way back as early as I can remember, you know, I would end up in my parents' room in the middle of the night, um, terrified that something was wrong with me. I'd find something on my body. And I, I really did. I just struggled a lot um, with that and didn't, but wasn't conscious that that's what was going on in me, if, if that makes sense. Wasn't able to tell my parents, like, I have anxiety all day long. I'm I'm really struggling all day. I wasn't able to do that. And so, you know, I developed like these weird tics when I was a kid that my parents didn't really know why I was doing that. So uh, I'm constantly helping people work through 
the stuff that took me so long to work through in my life. I went through a nervous breakdown in 2007 after, um, well, actually 2009, I went through a nervous breakdown. Um, after a divorce, my wife had left me uh, for somebody else. And I'd worked through that process and ended up in, you know, doing well and then burnt myself out in life, overworking, burnt myself out, not setting healthy boundaries, helping other people. I've done, you know, 20 years of counseling uh, and, and helping people. That, that's my main job uh, at Bethel Church where I work. And so, you know, this book, honestly, this story is a lot of my life story. It's a lot of what has my whole entire life has been so much about building a non-anxious life and learning how to get out of it. And so, man, I, I really do. I, I really mean what I'm saying. It's not just cool to have you on here, but this to me is right in my wheelhouse because I've spent so much time really working to get myself out of hell, working to get myself off of medication, working to get myself out of nervous breakdowns, and then in return, helping other people through it. And so um, it's cool. I'll, I'll ask you some questions that I have personally, but I just think, man, when I find a resource like this, it really is. It's exciting for me because so many people in our world are suffering. Our world is suffering so bad with anxiety, with depression, with purposelessness. And um, and so anything that we can do to help people out of that internal hell, I think is is a service to everyone. So well, dude, I appreciate yeah. that. One of the um you you highlighted this and um one of my main goals in writing this book, and I, I grew up in a in a church home, my, my wife and I are still practicing Christians ourselves. Um like if I think of an 11 to 16 year old little boy yeah, whose body is so geared up for fight or flight all day long, fighting battles that that 11 year old boy has no business fighting. Yeah. It was never that 12 year old boy's job to make sure dad didn't get all mad all the time. It was never yeah. that 13 year old boy's job to make sure mom was always pleased. That was her job. She was the adult, right? And so when I think of that and I think of, you know, masturbation's ability, especially for kids, but it, it provides that, um, release. Yep. It provides that, um, anti-anxiety, right? It's so quick to, we're, we're so quick to, for lack of better terms, to moralize it and to characterize mm -hmm. it is sure. a character failure or a moral failure. And I think that 11 year old little boy's body was working with the only tools it had in the best way possible. And I extrapolate that out to a 38-year-old guy who's got two kids and his wife is about to leave or feels like she's about to leave and your body starts shutting you down. That doesn't mean you're broken. That means your body's working exactly as it should. It should be trying yeah. to get your attention, right? And so yeah. there's something amazing about how we were designed and there's something amazing how these machines work, how our bodies work. We've just been told our whole lives that we're broken and screwed up and disgusting and bad. And I just think it's time for a new narrative because all that does is everybody walking around in shame, that gives us the world we got right now. And that's not good for yeah. anybody. No, it's so true. You know, I think I think the average man really misunderstands himself, how he got to where he's at. And, you know, as you know, whatever you misdiagnose, you mistreat. And so I do think that our first inheritance as men was supposed to be an inheritance of connection, unconditional love, of, you know, nurture in because of how most people have grown up today, you know, they didn't get that. They didn't get the care. They didn't get the concern. They didn't get the bonding. They didn't get that sense of attachment and that healthy attachment that really helps us cope with, with most of life. And therefore out of that, we are grabbing onto addictions. We're living these anxious lives. We're walking around with shame, walking around with tons of pain and you have to medicate all of that. That's what people don't understand is man, you didn't, you didn't, you weren't the one that created the world that you lived in. It was supposed to be an inheritance. You were supposed to live with people who really cared for you, loved you, nurtured you. They were supposed to really help you form a world full of peace. And so, you know, I, I really do think most men really understand, misunderstand most people, how they got to where they're at. And then therefore, by the time you're 17, 18, 19 years old, you have a picture of yourself that actually isn't correct at all. 
and you carry that on through your adulthood. And so, and church leaders, yeah. hey, let's like let's be honest. Like church leaders don't help, right? We tell no. eighteen and nineteen year olds that they're disgusting, they're screwed up, and they're broken. Yeah. And um, and those kids it's take true. those bricks and put them in their backpack, and they just start carrying them around. And those bags get real heavy. And a drink makes that backpack a lot lighter, right? Pornography makes that backpack a lot lighter in the moment, right? And yeah, there's something just about a collective empathy. I quit, I, uh, you know, I quit asking a long time ago, like, why are you drinking? And now I pull up a seat and I'm like, dude, what has happened in your life that this is the best way you can get through it? Um, that's a totally different approach, a different question. Yeah. It's such a good approach. Um, the, the thing that I've been in church my whole entire life and, um, you know, being in, in the stream that I've in, been in now for so long, we love theory. I think that that's one of the biggest challenges, the biggest problems, uh, even, even in a movement like ours where, uh, we're not necessarily shaming. I don't, I mean, we don't shame people for struggling with stuff. I, I would say the quote unquote church does, but I would say our, our movement is guilty of loving theory is if you have a problem, take it to God. If you're, if you're, uh, struggling with forgiveness, give it to God. Well, what the hell does that mean? Right. I, can't, I just imagine can't anybody... God going, there's a counselor right there. I put, I put <laughs> this, this psych, this psychiatrist right there. Like yeah. there's a weight room right there. And it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's really true. a bizarre disconnect between the world that God created and this mythical, just give it over to like, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> I've said that. I've asked that question a thousand times over, over my lifetime in church. What are you talking about? But man, we love that, right? Like we love, we love that kind of answer in, <clears throat> so it's, it's been my personal goal to actually give really practical tools to people because you have to, right? If you have a married couple sitting in front of you and you go like, you know what you need to do? You, you just need to pray more or, Hey, uh, have you ever thought about calming down? That's what, you know, if you have anxiety, just calm down. It's like, well, thanks. You know, everyone's prayed. Everyone's tried to calm down. Everyone has, has done all that they've known to do, shame themselves, uh, into trying lo to live a better life. But man, I, I want to dive in. I actually want to start and read this first. Um, it's page 18, but I just want to kind of open it up with this because I, I really do think that you captured where we are at um, really good. So I, I'll say this before I start too, because for, for those of you that don't know John, which I don't know you very well at all. I, I followed you for a while. But what I appreciated in this book is at the end of the book, you have a little section there that says, um, tell the truth. I think it says, tell the truth. And you're actually talking about you. You're talking about how this was one of the hardest projects you've ever worked on because you got you know, halfway through it and you realize, gosh, dang, man, I'm struggling with living out the thing that I'm trying to get people to live. And it's super cool because if we're all really honest with ourselves, you know, none of us are, are void of this stuff in our life. You know, we all, we all like to pretend us, you know, if you're in leadership, you like to pretend that your kids don't talk back, that your marriage doesn't have problems, that your mind uh, doesn't, doesn't have, you know, uh, conflict in it. But the truth is we're all in the same boat together and you've done such a good job at leading people really well by example and you go on to say, this is, I was really struggling. I had to stop and pause and take a real look at myself and start to practice. And then you actually write a whole section on, and this is where I'm at. And this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm moving forward. So I really respect that. Thanks no, I appreciate for doing that. that. Hey, that, uh, that book broke me. Um, whenever we sat down, whenever you sit down with your publisher, after you have a successful book, they like to tell you what you're going to do next. And you're like, no, I want to write a book about like unicorns and they're like, ah, you're going to write about anxiety. And I, th I thought I didn't want to do it because of the uh, topic. I was just kind of bored of it. I got about halfway through and I was like, oh, I don't want to do this because I'm not living this. And uh, yeah, it was gnarly, man. Dude, it's so good. All right, here we go. As promised, as I look deeply into my own mirror, this is me and my family too. You and me and all of us, we have created a frantic, chaotic roller coaster lives. We've either been dropped into anxious ecosystems, or we've built our own anxious lives from the ground up. And somewhere along the way, we've be become convinced that this was freedom. Or we know that there's more to life, but we don't know where to run. We're anxious on the way to work, anxious on the way home from work. We're glued to our phones for the latest housing and stock market numbers. 
If one card falls, the whole house comes crashing down. We've outsourced romance to The Bachelor, our homes to Chip and Joanna, our spiritual lives to Instagram and the scientific method, and our kids to digital babysitters. We've we've snapped uh, snapped at our children, look to remove stress by adding things, a new day planner, a yoga class, or a fat diet. Oh, sorry, fad diet. Use chemicals to wake up in the morning and rely on pills and drinks to drag ourselves into the dark waters of sleep at night. All the while, we're living in an environment we were never made for. Let me say that again. Uh, sorry, let me say it again another way because the main promise of this book, premise of this book, we're created, we've created a world our bodies cannot exist in. Sorry, I've got like a sixth grade reading level. I have a sixth but grade writing line, level, so <laughs> yeah, we're good. That last line is, is really where it's at. We've created a world our bodies cannot exist in. John, can you just tell me from your own perspective, like, what what made you write this book? What was the main motivation for it? I mean, with all due respect, I've got everything. I have a wife who was Dr. Deloney before me. She's brilliant. She's a West Texas farm girl. She's tough. Um, she's stunning, beautiful. I've ever, I have two healthy kids, um, one of which is real, real smart, and one of which is like terrifyingly smart. Like her dad can't keep up smart, and I, uh, my parents celebrated their fiftieth something. Man, I don't. They've been married fifty plus years. I got everything, man. And my body, if I'm not careful, will sound the alarms and shut everything down. And so it started with a simple question. Um, I work in I worked in higher ed forever, and so all, there was a lot of conversations about privilege. And you're just born with, um, you know, on third base, thinking you hit a triple, and the rest of us were born in the dugout, and we're trying to figure out. And so I spent several years working through that, just trying to think through that legitimately. And I think there's some truth to to that to that statement, to that sentiment, to that idea. Um, but the bigger picture was it kept nagging me was. Yeah, you kind of got a lot, man. And why are you anxious? (laughs) Like that ancient mechanism can't be used to keep you for keeping you safe. You're as safe as any human who's ever lived ever. Um, It can't be for, and I just start rattling it off. And so as I begin to just pull the string on what is, what is anxiety? And why are my friends marriage? Like, these are our best buddies. Why are they getting divorced? Why are they breaking up? Why is this? So as why are my students who are in law school, they have they were born the wrong color and the wrong side of town and they've overcome everything and they're here and now their bodies are shutting them down. Like, what what is happening? And so it began a quest to figure out what, we didn't all just get ADHD at the same time. We didn't all just get anxiety at the same time. Um, to call those diseases to call those genetic disorders. It's just not, it's just not scientifically accurate. And as I pulled the string on it, it's like, Oh man, we were not designed to do everything all of the time without stopping to be, have every human tragedy pumped into our mind, 24, seven, 365 to have a magic wand in our pocket that yes, is convenient, but it's convenient in the way of going to the gym and taking all the weight off the bar and expecting to get stronger. We can push a button and food just shows up at our house, but is that the best thing for all of us? Um, We can just, uh, you know, I can just take my wife to go see La La Land and I can pay a Hollywood couple to dance in jazz clubs all night, or I could just take my wife dancing. And that means I have to deal with the fact that I'm terrible at dancing. And that after means I have to deal with the fact that my wife and I, maybe we need to go to counseling because we're not, our marriage is falling apart and we couldn't survive two hours of dance. Right. So we've just created a distracted, exhausted world and we call it normal. And then all the specialists out there told us that we were broken. We were the problem. We were the problem when we were six years old and couldn't sit still in a chair all day for nine hours, which makes no sense. There is no science that backs that up. It will never make sense. Um, there it never made sense that somebody's anxious and a doctor looks at him and goes, well, you have this, you're broken. I'll fix you. Instead of saying, man, what's your body trying to tell you? What, what's it? Why is it trying to get your attention so loudly right now when you have all these other things? Um, and so 
that was really the premise. Just it, it, my dad was a SWAT hostage negotiator, and so I guess I was just <laughs> I was just uh, raised. It's kind of in the D- in our DNA. It's in the, our mitochondria. You walk into a room and just gauge. 365 degrees of this room, top to bottom, side, left to right. What's the full story here? And the full story we're getting about our world just isn't true. And so that was the point of the book. Dude, I love that. I um, I think that the, the average person doesn't actually really understand anxiety. And um, you talk a lot about that in the book, rightly so, because, man, if you don't understand anxiety, then you just walk around feeling like something's something inherently is bad. You have bad genes. You've got a, a, a bad mind. You've got some kind of disease that at any moment can just pounce on you. And then you're stuck with it. It really, it really is as somebody like me who struggle with anxiety. I always say I have a PhD in anxiety. I have, I've had it for so long. It can really feel like a prison sentence. And there's so much power in actually really understanding what is anxiety and what isn't anxiety. And I'd love for you just to unpack that a little bit. Like what is anxiety and why do we get it and and what's happening to us? Um, Anxiety is plain and simple. It's a smoke detector in your kitchen. That's it. It is simply an alarm system letting you know that your body has detected some things um, in the environment that are not safe for you. And that could be um, your body's not healthy. You're not okay. That your body has scanned its environment and it found out you were lonely. Even if you're sharing a bed with somebody that you've been married to for 10 years, um, you can be 2,000 miles away from somebody yet two inches away from them at the same time. Um, you can be lonely at a, crowd, at, a, at a crowded dinner table surrounded by your kids and your spouse. Um, if it if it scans the environment and realizes you're not safe, if you owe $30,000 in student loans and you have a $40,000 truck payment and you have a $200,000 mortgage, your brain would be failing you if it let you sleep all night knowing that if you say the wrong thing at work one time, you're fired and you lose your home, you lose the ability to get your kids groceries, you lose your transportation, you lose everything, you'd be failing. Or worse, your body is designed for the nerds, we call it agency or autonomy. Um, That's ownership. Who owns your life? If you owe money, the bank does. Your father-in-law does. Um, If you're a slave to your calendar, my, my friend is a pastor here in Nashville. He says, if busyness is your drug, rest will feel like stress. If busyness is how you walk around and flex to your wife and kids. This is, I've got value because look how busy I am. Um, then in the moments when your wife says, hey, I don't give a crap about your job. Will you just be with me? And you saddle up next to her, you'll feel anxious. You'll grab your phone. You will fidget. You will look something up on the internet because you can't sit still because you're a fiend. You're a dope addict, except your dope is accomplishment, achievement, and your job, right? So um, the downstream things, addictions, all di- addictions are, it's like climbing up on a ladder in your kitchen and, and duct taping a pillow around the smoke detector. It just helps quiet that alarm system down. And alcohol works. Pornography works. Cheating on your wife works. Those things actually work. They quiet the alarms for a minute. And when you come to, those alarms are louder than ever because your body's not going to let you down. And um, eventually, it will shut the whole machine down. And depression and anxiety are on the same trend line. And eventually your body says, oh, you're not getting the message. You're not getting the message. I'm just turning the car off and we're going to stop right here on the highway um, because I'm not going to keep driving that way. Right. And so anxiety is not um, it's not a disease. It's not a um, genetic disorder. Um, Your diagnosis of an anxiety disorder is not an identity or a death sentence. Um, It's not all these things we've been led to believe. And so I want people to begin to think. What if my body's working almost exactly as it should? What is it trying to tell me about the world I've created for it? I think that that's, I mean, that's one of the hardest things to do, right? Is to actually stop and walk into the anxiety, open it up, start to unpacking what's really going on inside of me. I know that um, 
that's where all the breakthrough lies, but it's freaking so terrifying to do that because- Oh, it's the, it's the like, worst, man. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> it's like we get so unconsciously used to ignoring it, running from it, um, but really the pathway, you talk a lot about it in the book, but the, the, the starting point, the pathway is being able to go like, man, I'm going to be brave enough to start asking myself really hard questions and to figure out why, why do I feel anxious all the time? How is my life really working? And I work with a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, uh, high net worth men and the story is almost the same every single time, which is they've poured their entire life effort energy into building their, their business, building their, you know, their net worth because at home, they don't feel super successful at home. Uh, they don't know what to do with their wife's emotions, right? The, probably the most terrifying thing for most men, uh, including myself is to stand in front of my wife when she's feeling really disappointed, when she's feeling overwhelmed because you know, that, that's a scary thing to do. That's, and so it's easy to bury yourself into the thing that you feel successful at and negate every other area of your life. And um, and men are also raised to believe that we have no value outside of our utility. Mm-hmm. And so if our wife is standing in front of us and there's an intruder coming, we feel like I can solve this problem. I'll grab a bat or I used to take Taekwondo when I was in eighth grade. I'll see what, what I can remember. Right. Yeah. And when we look at our wife and she's just weeping and saying, will you come hold me? And we don't have that tool in our toolkit. We feel useless and we run. And I think all of that stems from an inability for men. And we weren't, this isn't our fault. We were not given this roadmap, but we don't like ourselves, man. Yeah. We don't know why our wives don't like us. We don't like us. And so we create these crazy gymnastics rooms to run around and do somersaults in to distract ourselves from the fact that we think we're about worthless. Unless you ask me a set of facts that I know about. And man, um, until you look in the mirror and can put a fist in your chest and say, I love this guy. Mm -hmm. Until you can do that. You are going to be consuming your wife. You're going to be using her to make you feel better, whether that's through sex or that's through affirmation. Tell me you respect me. Tell me you respect me. That is consuming your wife. You are using her to feel better about yourself or worse. Most dads use their kids. You will be good on that T-ball field. You will be good, uh, a good little girl. You will be a good little boy and make these kind of grades because you're my report card for the world. And if you're not good, then you reflect bad on me and I don't know who the crap I am. And so I'm going to put that on you guys, right? Dude, it's so true. The crazy thing is how unconscious all of that is. All of it is is, unconscious. Yeah. All of it is. Yes. It is. And so many men, when they start to pull on that string and start to come to the realization, which is like, man, the first step. So a lot of guys are listening to John break that down and go like, well, dude, I don't even know how to love myself. I don't even know. The first step is actually coming to the point where you realize, oh my gosh, I've got this message going on in my head all day long that is basically tearing me down, that is keeping keeping record of my faults, or I'm living a life that isn't actually true. I'm, I am pretending to be somebody over here that I actually don't, it's not, there's no congruency between my inner world and my outer world. That's the first step, right? That's the, that's the starting point for, for most men to come to the place where they can go, man, I don't really love me. And then I think the next, and you can, you can add more to this, but I do think the next step is to actually go, where did you learn that you weren't lovable? Right. Like, well, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's that it's that ticker that? tape. It's that ticker tape that runs under you know the news stations that runs underneath the, the story of our life, which is you suck, you suck. You're too fat. You're too dumb. You don't make enough money. You're too slow. You're too slow in elementary school. You're too slow now. Um, you weren't good enough for Susan in ninth grade. You're not going to be good enough for your wife now. And that who wants to be married to a you suck? I suck. I suck. I suck. And then she goes and texts some other guy, and it just confirms everything. You you create this world that there's only going to be a couple of outcomes. And so um, 
Yeah, it's about pulling the lever. Where did that message come from? Who said I'm, who said I'm, if you hang out with professional MMA fighters, only a couple of them have abs outside of fight week when they're cutting weight. They just don't. They are just big dudes or they're strong dudes and small dudes. I saw, I remember seeing BJ Penn once in uh, Las Vegas and I thought, uh, we were hanging out in the thing. And I was like, I would fight that guy. If he was like out in the neighborhood and like called my wife, I would fight that guy and I'd wake up nine days later with both of my arms shoved up my, my behind. Right. So it's like this picture we have, who told us that? Right. Like who told us the Instagram? Is that where we're going to, we're going to kill ourselves for Instagram? Really? Um, are we still letting our abusive dad speak into our life? Is my abusive dad still ruining my household? Cause it's time I took back over. Is my mom where I can never be enough for? She's never said she's proud of me. Um, not my real mom, by the way, I'm just being an every man, but, um, am I going to continue to let her speak into my, my life? Because this woman right here, she said, I do forever. She looked me in the eyes and says, I love you. What if I believed her instead of that woman that hurt me my whole life, right? Those are hard conversations, but you got to pull the string. Where do those messages that I'm not enough come from? Yeah, it's real. You know, the in Brave Co., so <clears throat> what we've done is we've, uh, we're basically a discipleship movement and everything we do is rallies around discipleship. So um, we, we took uh, about a thousand guys through, uh, our discipleship programs last year. And one of the, one of the main things that we have guys do is tell their story and they map it out the highs and the lows. And they, they actually explain, you know, this is, these are all the good things that happened to me. And these are the bad things that happened to me. And these are the cycles in my life. They, they sit down and really just map out. This is, this is how the cycle started. This is how it keeps going. And it, it's just so crazy how many men and I said this earlier, but they don't actually know how they got to where they're at until they really sit down and map it out and go, oh my gosh, the way that I talk to me, that's actually my dad's voice. My expectations of myself, oh, that's because this and this and this happened my whole entire life. I could never get a, man, you're good enough. You're doing this. You've got what it takes. I never answered that question in my life that I have what it takes. I've been trying to do that through all these other things, right? And it's such a powerful revelation when a man comes to the place where he realizes this is the way that I am right now isn't all my fault. It's my responsibility. Is not it's this may not be all my fault, but this is my responsibility. Um, one of the things that you did that I really like, and I'm gonna have you take us through it. So um, Hey, uh, real quick, I want to say something uh, before you leave that because yeah, I think it's it. important. Um yeah. We have reached this cultural moment where more men are talking about this. Yeah. And as men begin to realize, oh my gosh, I do have this ticker tape run under my life. Um, I do have this, I'm trying to fight everybody and I'm 44 years old and I'm at a t-ball game trying to fight another dad. Like, that guy can't possibly be making me that mad. I don't even know that dad. Yeah. Um, now that we have a generation of men beginning to ask questions about why is their body trying to take care of them, which is another way for saying feelings, right? Yeah. We also have a generation of men who are feeling feelings and then just shutting down because they don't know where to go next. Yeah. And I think we've been sold a lie over the last hundred years, which is mental health is just all the right thoughts in all the right order. And if you just think about things in the right way and journal about them for a while, then you're going to be okay. And that's just simply not true. You do have to dig into these constant ruminating thoughts, these things that you loop on, these things that you stay with, and you got to go do the next right thing. And so I know it's big and cool to flex on Instagram and say, like, fake it till you make it. That's so stupid. You be you, bro. <laughs> stupid. Treat yeah. your wife right, even when yeah. you don't feel like it. Show up with your kids, shut your mouth, and look at your daughter and say, I love you, and I'm so glad I get to be your dad. Even when inside you feel like you're, two years old and one inch high. Keep doing the right things as you are digging into where these stories come from. Because what you're going to find is the confidence and the strength to head out of those stories and to write new ones comes from these countless little wins you have by yeah. continuing to show up and show up and show up and do the right thing even when you don't feel like it. And that's the, that's the new third way, man. We've got two opposing sides in our culture and it's time that we create a new third way. Bro, that's so good. You know, 
a lot of a lot of men want confidence, but they don't understand that confidence comes through competence. It comes through doing, it comes through taking action, right? And you stack that deck, and eventually you go like, "Man, I'm pretty good at this thing. I've done it over and over and over again." I do think, and we'll talk about it. I'm sure when you when you outline uh, this next part, but I really think everyone's always looking for a cheat code, right? And there's there are very few real cheat codes in life. Very uh, few, very few. Yeah, very few. To me, the one real one that really does help and work is to put yourself in a group of people who are going the same direction as you, who have uh, a little bit more determination than you, who are going to pull the best out of you and and help you to get to that that next place. And I mean, I've just seen it over and over and over again. If If a guy will humble himself enough to grab a couple of other dudes and say, Hey man, this is really where I'm at. And I think guys mistake, especially in the church, right? Like accountability in the church used to look like, Hey, let's go to coffee and you tell me all your sins. And it's like, dude, how many times do you want to do that? Like none, even if you buy the coffee, I don't even drink. I don't want to do that. But if a guy will, will start to go, Hey, I work out, you know, I work out three days a week. You want to come with me? Or, hey, I'm starting to work out. Would you like to come with me? Or, hey, I'm, you know, I'm working on my marriage. You want to, you want to go, like, you want to do the same thing? We can all do the same thing together, right? Like, we start to go down this path together. That's been what I've seen in the last three years from what we're doing is simply just just getting guys to commit to doing life with one another, do hobbies together, go fishing, go hunting. You don't even have to go super deep. Just starting on that level of, okay, I am on a path with other men going this direction. Because here's the thing. If I know that my three friends are going to work out today, dude, I'm frigging going to work out whether I want to or not. And I know that when those guys go home, I mean, for me, it's still for me. And I lead the movement. I know that when I come home and my family is in a tough place, I know my other friends are going home and they're going to show up and be present for their wives. It's a lot of motivation for me because I know that like I'm going to come back and we're all doing this thing together. We have this tribe mentality. We're all going the same direction. And if guys want the cheat code, don't freaking do it on your own because that's how you got here. It's how you got here. Yeah, you can't. Um, yeah. All accountability, I think it, it's distilled down into two things. Number one, are we being who we said we were going to be? That's yeah. it. Like, don't overthink it. Are we being who we said we were going to be? It's not a, um, I don't know. It's not a gotcha session. Are we being who yeah. we said we were going to be? And here's the other side of accountability that we've completely lost in the church. In the church, it's about writing down all the sins. Yeah. The other side yeah. of accountability is, do you see me? all of me and do you still love me and the answer is i do yeah accountability is dude we agreed we're all going to do do something nice for our wives and you didn't next week you're in it's not shame it's not run away hey i used to be a part of a group of guys and there was times i did things on sunday night because i knew slade sullivan was going to ask me about a monday morning like (laughs) he would go around the room Everybody say yeah. something they did for their wife last week. And I was like, and Sunday night, I'd be like, oh crap, I haven't done anything. And I, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, but hey, it was those little wins. And yeah. over the long haul, after six months of doing that, I started looking forward to it. So um, here's, that's another pet peeve of mine. This uh, follow your passion, the stupidest advice in the world. <laughs> yeah. You, we become passionate about what we're good at and we get good at things that we do regularly. And most of us do things regularly when there's consequences if we don't. If we have to. And That's so good, man. just keep doing nice things for your wife over and over again. And if you're not a child, eventually, and let's be honest, there's another side to that. If she looks at you and I says, thank you, I see you. And I'm so grateful. Yeah. Over time, you'll be become, you'll be, you'll become passionate about something that you're good at and you become good at being a husband. Yeah. And when you fall down, it's all right. Jose Altuve strikes out too. Um, it happens, right? Yeah. I mean that, that it really is the deal. And, and I think just reminding guys, like we got here by talking about 
how to get out of the place where you don't love you. It's, man, you gotta, you gotta build a life that you really love. You have to be honest with yourself. You gotta show up and be present at the places that really matter in your life. And you gotta get on a path, like you can't lay in bed and put off taking care of your body and put off taking care of your family and put off, you know, your connection with God and somehow feel great about yourself. It doesn't happen. There's no magic pill for that. And so, you can not do it alone period. Yeah, you can't. So we got to get over all that stuff and, and get over the fear of, of, uh, yeah, the rejection in your life and and invite some guys. So I really want to get to this before, before we have to, to end, because you lay out six, um, daily choices in your book that are all the, the areas that we really need to, to get in order. And, I just, re- I really loved going through each one of them and evaluating my own life and starting to go through like, okay, how am I in this one? And how am I in that one? And what area do I need to shore up here? Can you just take us through some of those, um, six daily choices and uh, just a little bit about each one of them? Uh, because I just, I think that it's really going to help guys, especially categorize like what area of my life is really weak in what area of my life is, is like, is, is strong. And, you know, I just need to keep on track here. Yeah. I love that. And I, I would say this, um, we created an anxiety test. It's not a diagnostic thing, but we created something where you can click through and answer some questions and it will point it out to you with red, yellow, and green. That's the, cool. Six areas. And so you can go to John Deloney.com slash anxiety test. I don't even ask for your email address. I don't want to know you. I, I mean, I do want to know you, but like this yeah. isn't a gotcha or like to sign you up for my newsletter. It's not that. This is simply a, an instructive tool for a guy in the middle of the night or um, a mom who's exhausted in the middle of the night to say, I don't even know where to start. This is a, a roadmap to say, hey, we think the it's a diagnostic test that you run on your car, right? Um, so I'll just go through them pretty quick. First, yeah, the first it. thing, and, and by the way, these aren't like in a sequential order. Everybody's yeah. gonna have a couple of these that they do easy and real well. Some of these are going to be challenging, but like, oh yeah. And a couple of them are going to be awful to go through depending on who you are and what your environment is and how you were raised and all those things in, in, in together. Um, the first thing, um, you have to choose reality. We live in the age of distraction and, um, my joke, and I say this on almost every interview, um, Netflix has taken away the remote control. We don't even need that anymore. You yeah, just sit true. there and it's like, Hey, we, uh, we mine your home internet. We know all the sites that you go to and we know every single channel you watch and for how long and which scenes you pause and which scenes you fast forward. We know everything about you. Here's the next show you want to watch. We know you better than you do. And we don't even have to push play. They just start it, right? So we live in a, in a, a completely distracted, look over here, look over here. There's a liquor store in every corner. There's pornography in every front behind every screen. There are distractions everywhere. And so you can get distracted all day long, but your brain knows if your marriage is falling apart. Yeah. Your brain knows if you're about to get fired. Your brain knows that your kid just walked in the front door and just headed to the room and shut the door. And you can go, oh, those teenagers, your brain knows something's wrong with that relationship. And it will sound the alarms to get your attention. That's anxiety. And so you have to choose reality. How do you choose reality? It's brutal. And sometimes you need a therapist or a pastor or a couple of close friends, to be honest with you. What is the state of my marriage? What is the state of my health? How overweight am I? Hmm. Can I run a mile without stopping? Like, what is the state of things? What's the state of my finances? What's the state of my job? Is my job about to go away because of AI, in fact, for real? Um, What is the state of fill in the blank? The housing market in my neighborhood? Like, Choose reality because your body is solving for it 24-7, 365, whether you are or not. The second thing is, like we mentioned, you got to choose connection. Um, We are tribal animals. We are created. Your body would be failing you if you were lonely and it let you sleep the whole night without waking up at 3.15 a.m. It would be failing you um, because it knows you're on your own. Um, There's been some studies out recently. Everything from seven out of 10 to six out of 10. I don't want to get caught up on the details, but most Americans don't have somebody to call at 2 a.m. Yeah. They have to take their wife to the ER and they got two sleeping kids in the house. They got no one. 
it's, that's so crazy to me, man. And, yeah. and, and I know that that's like, I know that that statistic is a hundred percent real because of what I do for a living Correct. working with men. Guys don't have anybody. Nobody. And they, Nobody. They, underest, they underestimate the impact of that thing right there is I literally Your don't body have would be failing you if it let you sleep all night. Your body would be failing you if it let you have a moment of deep, sensual intimacy with your wife. Because your body's trying to not die. Do you not see that we got nobody watching the front or back? We got nobody getting food. It's just you. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this is a lot, like jillions of years landing right here in modern America or modern earth right now, right? Yeah. Um, the third one is, oh, what's the third one? Uh, choose freedom. And I don't mean that in like the pew pew kind of way, like the eagle across the, like, oh! not like that. <laughs> but I mean, um, choose freedom. The nerd word is agency autonomy. I think we talked about that. Yeah. Who's running your life? Are you deciding what you're going to do tomorrow or is your mortgage company deciding? Are you deciding whether you're going to stay in this abusive, toxic work environment or is your student loan service provider? Are you sitting at home playing ping pong with the government? You pay off my loans. No, you pay off the loans. Or are you saying, I'm tired of waiting for someone to come rescue me? I signed my name on the loans. Even though I was 18, I didn't know what I was signing. I signed them. I'm paying them off. That's on me. Um, oh, I can't afford to live in Manhattan and be a copy editor and have to pay back these student loans. Then you got to choose reality. And maybe you can't live in Manhattan anymore. Maybe it's time to go to Kansas where the cost of living is cheaper and you can do a job that's peripheral. That's not going to be as cool and wasn't what the picture you drew on your wall on your vision board when you're nine. This is reality. It's and like, it's taking extreme ownership. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. And, and yeah. I've had some opportunity to spend some time with Jocko and it's that it's not by my hand, but in my lap, I'm here. I'm in charge of me. Who's running the show? And if your body finds that you are in the backseat of your own life, it will sound the alarms. If it realizes that your mother-in-law is still telling your family where y'all are going to do holidays, <laughs> not you, not the fact that you worked like crazy in Q4 and you're so tired you can't breathe. And the greatest thing for your family would be a week at home with nothing. Maybe a quick sneak out to the deer lease and the rest of it, nothing. But mother-in-law says, y'all getting your butts on a plane and you're coming here because we do Christmas here. And your wife's like, oh, we got to go. And you're like, oh my, who's running your life? Or when it comes to clutter and a chaos, there's a lot of literature out there on, we have so much freaking stuff at our houses yeah. and bodies designed for scarcity. We're designed for, oh my gosh, there's two weeks out of a year when we got apples. And now we have apples at every stopping, I mean, every gas station in america much less the supermarkets and we can ship them all over the world our bodies aren't designed for that much apples right and i say apples i'm talking about <laughs> i have seven guitars let's just yeah. i'll just call it out <laughs> i'm still waiting for my favorite metal band to call me they're not calling and if they did i'm not that great there's no reason i should have seven guitars but i was literally looking last night for another one because i just need the i just need the other right <laughs> we, I've got, I've got shelves of books that are mostly designed to show people who visit my house, how smart I am. Mostly to virtue signal. Look at, look at these books that I've read. I've spent time doing while you guys were out doing whatever you were doing. I was reading nerd books and they're like, yeah, we have memories and joy in our heart. And I'm like, yeah, but I read these books. <laughs> like, um, or you hear the, the famous conversations with, um, veterans who come back and talk to rookie basketball players and football players who suddenly have a jillion dollars and they say, Hey, you need one car. You need one. You need one house. You need one wife. You need one mm -hmm. watch. Right. So, um, we have so much clutter, so much stuff. Um, the next one is choosing health and healing. And that is everything from our physical bodies. Um, we just have reached a point where I don't think it's honest to talk about depression, to talk about, um, anxiety, to talk about ADHD, to talk about, disconnection to talk about the lack of sex our culture is having we're having some of the, the the least amount of sex in recorded human history across multiple age demographics we can't have that conversation without talking about how terrible we treat our bodies hmm. and i'm 
when I talk about obesity, I'm not just talking about aesthetics. I'm talking about our bodies aren't working properly because we're running them into the ground and we don't move and we're sedentary and we just push a button and they drop food off on our front porch. And we have created a world that our bodies are simply aren't healthy. And on top of that, health and healing also means if you are sexually abused as a young man, as a child, you got to deal with that. Yeah, it's real. It's real. If your yeah. dad was more interested in his work than you, you got to deal with that. If yeah. you, it was your job to make sure mom didn't get out of control, you got to deal with that. If you played cello and your brother was on the football team and everybody rod rod about him and everyone laughed at you, you got to have that conversation. You're going to have to heal from that because your nervous system has created a world where you're not enough. You're always looking for the next threat. You're always mm-hmm. looking for the person who slighted you and you will fight everyone or you'll run from everyone until you sit down and teach your nervous system something new. The next one is choose mindfulness. And most of us think of just like an old dude on a cloud with a beard. And it's like hippies uh, listening to Sam Harris and rubbing essential oils on their foreheads. That's not what I'm talking about. Mindfulness can be distilled down into two words, awareness and curiosity. Here's a simple example. I may have put this in the book. I I may have ended up taking it out. Let's say you and your wife have a long drawn out discussion one night, one Sunday night about how she keeps leaving wet towels in the floor. And she tries to explain to you, I'm having to get the kids lunches ready for tomorrow. You're not helping. Well, Sunday night football. Of course I'm not helping. She has to take care of the dishes. Plus get ready for her job tomorrow morning. And, 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 and you say, every time I come to the bathroom, there's always wet towels on the floor. You agree to help more around the house. She's very clear about what she, what help she actually needs. And you are clear. Hey, When I come into the bathroom in the morning and there's just wet towels everywhere and I stumble in half asleep, I feel like you don't love me. I feel like you don't care about me. And she's like, I will be all over that. And then the next day comes around, you get home from work and she's still not home yet. And you walk in the bathroom and there's two wet towels right there on the floor. Choosing mindfulness is this. Your body instantly goes to defend you. And to prop you up and men, um, often men express depression by puffing their chest out. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look at the statistics and see that women um, are diagnosed with depression more than men. They're, de- they're diagnosed with anxiety more than men. I don't think that's true. I think men express depression. If you look at people in jail, it's way more men because they yeah. express depression with their fists, not by getting under the covers. Some do, yeah. but often men express depression by puffing their chest out. Men express uh, express and they experience anxiety as anger, as rage, as I'm trapped. And you see those two towels. Mindfulness is being aware. Oh my gosh, why is my body getting all worked up? What in the world? And being curious instead of making up a story. My wife just left those towels there because she thinks that instead of going down that road and your body dumps cortisol and adrenaline into the system and it's ready to go, it's go time. Curiosity is. We just talked about this last night. What in the world must have happened in her day that this happened this morning? I'm going to grab these towels and I'm going to go make sure that the dishes are done. And I'm going to make sure that the kids are outside playing soccer with me when she gets home. One of those leads to connection. One of those, even if she did it just out of spite, at least you can have that conversation and your heartbeat's going to be under 95 beats a minute um, versus going to war, right? That's mindfulness. Why is my kid uh, walk away? Go ahead. Can we all agree that that is ninja level uh, (laughs) stuff? Hey, uh, the great Judd Brewer who wrote a a pretty amazing book about anxiety. um, He's a researcher, I think at Yale, he's, he's smarter than me by a thousand X. Like I'm a middle school basketball player. He's Michael Jordan. (laughs) Um, He says, if you can get a millisecond, you're winning between the moment you feel the thing and when you choose to act. If you can just begin to push that gap millisecond by millisecond, just a tiny sliver of, (gasps) my kid just yelled at me, she's seven. That's what seven-year-olds do. They're a bundle (laughs) of nerves. She's not going to grow up to be a disrespectful woman who doesn't know. Why would a seven-year-old scream at a man who loves her? And tells her he loves her every day. What must have happened in her day? What must be happening in her mind? And then usually you land on, oh, I gave all the kids donuts this morning. And I let them stay up till 10 o'clock last night to watch whatever. 
and now they're in a cranky mood Saturday morning. It has nothing yeah, to do this with is what I get. Right. They don't respect me. Right. So <laughs> uh, it's practicing. And often here's a quick hack. When you feel it coming on, take a deep breath and hold it as long as you can. Just hold as long as you can. I don't care if it's two seconds, 10 seconds, four minutes. I don't care. Just hold it. I always tell guys like, you got to be the scientist and not the judge, right? Like if you're practicing the scientist, when something goes wrong, says what happened? Like explain to me, you know, show me what happened. The judge says, who's at fault. Right. And in our life, in our lives, if we could walk around and think, man, I, I gotta be the scientist. I gotta be the guy that's just, I'm just taking in data. I'm, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt. This is, has no bearing on, you know, whether I'm good or bad or they're evil or, I just need the information and the data, and I can remove a whole bunch of emotion from it, look at it more objectively. Like and that by the seems... way, your body's doing what it's doing, right? The yeah. other day I was driving home from a thing. It was amazing. I had some buddies. Uh, we were all going to a concert in downtown Nashville. I was the driver. I couldn't find my keys, and my wife had taken the kids, and I called her, and I was like, hey, where's the keys to, to my car? And she was like, uh, oh, no, I've got them. I got both of our keys. And I was like, oh, man. So I've got an old farm truck. I was like, oh, geez. All right, well, I'll take the truck. That's going to be hilarious. So I go to get in the truck. I can't find both sets of those keys. And I call her like, hey, do you know where the truck keys are? And she's like, oh, my gosh. She had six sets of keys in her in her purse. And I ended up calling a buddy. He drives a Tesla. It was not charged. I ended up pushing a Tesla with my buddy and it filming me. He, la he was laughing so hard. <laughs> it ran out of juice. And we had to call another dude. Anyway. While I'm, I'm, dude, I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated. I think I'm going to miss this concert. And then I literally thought, is anything I'm thinking or feeling doing anything to help this situation? And it was yeah. just like, almost like, <laughs> no, like I almost like laughed. Like what in the world is getting mad at my wife while she's 70 miles away from me? What is that going to solve? And is, is, is my self-righteousness going to help this battery powered car like move itself no no like lighten up laugh because you're out of batteries you're pushing a you know you're pushing a tesla down the road and the driver can't help you because he's too small anyway so so anyway yes that is ninja level stuff um the last one is choose belief and in a short quick sentence in the last 200 years we've solved for some problems that have plagued humanity forever we've solved for infectious disease if you get an infection you don't die from a cut on your knee anymore you just rub some Neosporin on it. Um, you can push a button and food gets dropped off on your front porch. You can go to these big, well-lit, you know, metal boxes that are full of produce shipped from all corners of the earth. Um, you can turn a little nozzle and water comes out of it in your bathroom. You can go poo-poo and tee, tee in your bathroom. I've got a child, young child in my house. Yeah, you, you do. Tell. You can go to the bathroom and you just push a button and it just takes it away from you and sends it across your city. And in the so doing, we've gotten very, very arrogant. And so the final thing is when your body believes it's holding up the universe, that it's responsible for everything, it will sound the alarms because the self was never intended to hold up everything. Self-actualization is a myth. It's not real. Yeah. And so you have to choose belief. You have to walk outside your tent like our ancestors have done for millennia and look up at the sky and say, dear God, please reign. Because if yeah. it doesn't, my kids die. And we can pretend that we're in control. We can pretend that we've got this hard grasp on everything. It's a good way to suffocate everyone we love and ourselves. So you have to choose belief. And choosing belief is opening your hands and taking a knee and saying, I'm not the center of the universe. God, please help. You know, it really does help to have the outline though, right? Because you can go through and start to really diagnose what it is in your life that you do good, what it is in your life that you don't do good, and then begin to really focus on those. Um, I think for me, I I have this underlying uh, feeling that I'm not doing enough. There's 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 always something more that I could be doing to be more efficient, to move this thing along, to and then I'm behind, right? So that's a thing that I would personally have to battle in. Uh, some of it comes from, you know, running with guys who, I mean, my dad and Pastor Bill Johnson and all, you know, Danny Silk, these guys that are so much further ahead 
because they should be in life. It's easy to look at those guys and to go like, man, where was my dad when he was 43 years old? Where was Danny when he was 40? And, and you start to compare yourself being afraid, one, that you're not enough, and two, that you're not doing enough. And so it is easy to walk around with a sense that I'm I'm behind, I'm not doing enough, I should be doing more. And and to feel like there's I'm being successful if I fill up my calendar, right? If I just do more stuff, if if I if I have a really full day, then that means I'm moving the needle forward. And I would say for me, that's the biggest area that I always have to continually come back and reevaluate. It's not the amount of things I do that is getting me from point A to point B. It's not filling up my calendar that is actually being successful or uh, even even stewarding my time all. It's, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I spending my time the way that I really should be spending my time? Am I talking to myself the way that, and, and I, am I really telling myself the real story? So I, re, I remember um, probably five years ago, I had this real sense of, man, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm failing. I had a goal. I wrote my first book when I was uh, 29 and I just had a goal to write a book a year. You know, my dad writes a book a year. All the guys that I run with write a book a year close to It's a lot of books, man. That's a lot of books. It's a ton of books. Yeah, it's a ton. (laughs) And so, you know, you make these lofty goals and I looked back and was like, man, I've only, I haven't written a book a year. I I think I was uh, 38 at the time. And I was really in this hard, I was in this hard place. I was, it really felt, it really felt heavy for a moment. And then I stopped and I asked myself, okay, well, what did you do from 29 to 38? What did you actually do? I, I got remarried. I blended a family. I got off my medication. I went through seven years of infertility. Like that's actually the real story, right? The real story is, dang, I did a whole bunch of really hard, courageous stuff in writing a book although it may have felt like an accomplishment, actually wasn't the most important thing to do. But that's a hard thing, right? It takes me stopping. It actually takes me stopping and and facing my own fear that I'm not doing enough or sometimes my own shame, right? Well, and, I, I, I want to take that from you, man. I, I don't think it's your fault. We have a cultural narrative that asks one question of men. What are you worth? Yeah. And we answer that question with a freaking number. What are you worth? Yeah. My assets minus my liabilities. That's yeah. what I'm worth. Are you in the thousand air club? Is your are you in the M club? Are you in the B club? What are you worth? And the answer to that question is never a number. Yeah. If you go look, um, I, I working in higher ed for so many years, I got to spend so many fun lunches and eating nachos and sharing drinks with some of the most brilliant theologians from across the planet. And several of them challenged me to look at Jesus through an economic disruption lens. Wow. And when he was going in and blowing things up, when he was ascending, casting pigs, which would have been somebody's net worth over the side of a hill to save yeah. one guy, um, dumping over the tables, the money changers. I like to look at that like a Navy SEAL Jesus, but it had way more to do with you will not charge these poor people. You're trumped up, made up crap on how they're going to, they're going to buy their way to love. And they're going to buy it yeah. through you. It's not how that works. I love them. And so if you look at them through an economic disruption lens, the whole thing gets dumped on its head. The answer to the question, what are you worth? Will always be who loves well, you and who do you love? Period. Yeah. Yeah. Period. 100%. That's the answer to that question. And so, um, And I'll also say this, I was uh, doing an interview recently and somebody told me this and I got choked up on somebody else's show. (laughs) Guy told me that his wife wrote down all the things he's done that she figured that she thought was amazing over a 10 year period. Wow. My friend George Campbell says we often underestimate what we can do in 10 years and we way overestimate what we can do in one day, right? Um, But she wrote everything down and had a similar realization when he was looking at this. It's like, oh, I I had my soul ripped out and I still was breathing. I found love again and I found the courage to do so. I did X. I blended a family. I fill in the blank. 
Like, dude, you went to war for seven years. Forget your stupid books. Look what you've done. You know what you've done? You've created a new family tree. Yep. Right? And you've plowed the field so those those roots can grow for miles. And it was just this like, oh my gosh, man. I just get so focused on, did I write my seven pages today (laughs) towards my goal of what a wild way to live? Was my daughter nice today? Was she mean today? What a terrible way to live our lives. Instead of doing that, backing up and being like, I am raising an incredible, brilliant young girl. And that brilliant, incredible girl is going to go head on in a head on collision with culture. She's going to have some, a tough road to hoe. And so I'm not going to hold her accountable for everything. I'm going to make sure that she knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, her old man's right here, right? That what a different track. So good for you, man. I'm proud of you. No, I mean, we all have things that, that we, that we have to work through. I think one of my, um, one of my favorite things in the book was, I, I just found it really quick, was this last part where you talk about um, choosing your hard. And uh, I'm just going to read it a little bit and kind of in closing, but um, it's, it's, I guess it's a poem that someone wrote. It says, marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your heart. Obesity is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your heart. Being in debt is hard. Having control of your finances is hard. Choose your heart. Clearly communicating your needs is hard. Living a life where no one knows your needs is hard. Choose your heart. Life is always hard, but we can choose our heart. Pick wisely. And I really think that that's that's kind of the that's kind of the premise of all of life. In you in one of the um somewhere in the book you were talking about you you have to have a plan for bad things happening. And you, you made the illustration where um, somebody you're talking to said, I don't have a plan for a meteor hitting the earth, but you got to have a plan for your car breaking down. You have to have a plan for, you know, y- your financial, your finances to take a little bit of a dip. You got to make a plan for, you know, your relationships to go through a bit of a hard time, a death in a family. My mother-in-law's currently, she's in the last hour of her life right now, literally. And my wife's laying next to her. Like I have to plan margin into my life for those types of things. Because if we don't, we're all fooling ourselves, right? We're all fooling ourselves that somehow I'm going to escape life that I'm going to escape the hard parts of life in none of us escape the hard parts of life. And if there's anything in life that we really enjoy, that we really love, that's really bringing us long-term satisfaction, it's because we did something hard to create that. We stewarded it. You know, we stewarded our finances. We stewarded our relationships. We stewarded our physical fitness, our relationship with God. All of that stuff was hard, but it sure beats the hell out of living, trying to take the easy road and being obese and being in disconnected relationships and having our past dictate our future because we never actually look back into those old places in our life that are scary, that have trauma in them, that are painful. And I really do think, you know, this book for, for a lot of people is going to be a catalyst into them being able to bravely walk into those places in their life that they've neglected and, and let go. And, and it's a, it is an opportunity to partner with reality and partner with hope and partner with truth and really take the power back in your life and, and grow stronger. And so, um, John, great job on the book. It's a e- really easy read and, um, you've done such a great job at laying it out really simply for people. And I, I think, you know, um, as a guy who has two PhDs, you have made something hard, really simple. And I think that uh, a lot of people mess that up when the smarter they get, the harder thing uh, they make things, but you've done a great job at, at making it simple. And so, man, thank you so much for for writing this book and for coming on um, our podcast and just laying it out here for us. You're, you're a great man. And I think I always like to bring guys on here that I respect because in our day and age, there's not a lot of men the other men can really look at and and set a target like I want I want my marriage to be like that. I want my relationships to be like that. I want my kids to be like, you know, like the way that he's parenting his kids, which we all know isn't perfect. We know that you don't walk come home and your kids do everything you say. But, <laughs> but my wife said the other day, um, 
I'm filming the 500th episode of my show um, next week, and my surprise guest is my wife. And wow. um, the producer sent her some questions, and we were going for our, our we every week we go for a super long five or six mile walk, walk together. And on the walk, she was talking through some of her answers, and she said, "I just want people to know you're not as good as they think you are, <laughs> and you're not as bad as they think you are too." And you're a really good yeah. dad trying to do better. And you're a really good husband that can do better. And you're trying to do better. And I think that's the truth. I think all of us are um, doing our best. And um, I think that's what we can ask of each other. And if we see a brother who's fallen, man, stop what you're doing. Put the judgment in your back pocket and pick him up. And then we'll figure it out later. And if he asks, hey, man, how can I get better? Then I'll let you know. But dude, I'm really grateful for your that's hospitality, awesome. man. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome, man. So guys, go on. Uh, you can go to johndeloney.com and pick up his book. By the time this podcast comes out, the book will be out and uh, you guys can can grab that up. You can also go um, uh, follow John at John Deloney uh, on Instagram and all the other places where everyone's found now. So John, thank you so much for your time, man. You're a beast. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I appreciate it. Thank you, you my brother. Thank you. Brave come in. Stay brave this week. We'll see you next week. Hey, Brave Co. Men, are you looking for adventure, looking for a way to get away, hang out with other men, shoot some guns, do a high ropes course? We have the thing for you. It's called the Brave Co. Experience. October 4th through the 8th, we will be in Utah, Alabama. This will be a place where you will hang out with other men in an exclusive environment. We cook some really good food. We do high ropes courses. We teach you how to shoot out to a thousand yards with a rifle and also teach you how to handle that pistol in a way that makes you feel confident. So if you're looking for an experience like this, go to braveco.org to learn more about it.